Hi, it's Mark Owen from Moose Market PR, the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks. Today I'm joined by the Right Honourable Richard Graham, the MP for Gloucestershire, or Gloucester, not Gloucestershire, uh, since 2010. Welcome, Richard. Welcome to Punchline Talks. Hi, Mark. Nice to see you. Thanks. Thanks so much. You're obviously in the Houses of Parliament today, and um, I mean, it must be a crazy time to be a politician over the last couple of years. I mean, you've been a politician for 10 years, so you've seen it all. Is it three prime ministers you work, worked yeah. under now? Not, uh, yeah. not, and, 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 um, and lots of them been here as well. Yes. Over that well, time. So can you just briefly tell us uh, what, which sort of chair, you know, chairs do you sit on and different, uh, different bodies that you sit on there in Parliament? Yeah, so I do a variety of things, Mark. Um, uh, you know, the most important of which is to do the job for my constituents, the people who put me here. And uh, the sort of thing that people don't always uh, necessarily know about is that we run a sort of projects list of about 30, sometimes 35 different things. And these are all projects which are things that are going to be good for Gloucester. So, for example, all about the regeneration of the railway station, the underpass, the exit out of the car park onto Metzway, uh, the new facade of the station, a better forecourt, a bus stop there easier turn on to Bruton Way, all that sort of stuff. That's one example of a project. Um, there are all sorts of other things there, including the um, prospective new green energy park at the Hempstead Recycling Centre, where my dream is to have massive solar energy, a couple of big onshore wind stations there, and then eventually hydrogen as well. And all of this is possible on a sort of two to three year period. So we run a whole series of projects, and that's where I think my background in business comes in handy. Yeah, I mean, can you go back? Can you go to that background in business? Actually, um, uh, where did you go to school? It was it. It was it. Was it Eton? I think you went to, wasn't it? And um, you know, where, where did you? Where were you born, sir? And where, let's go through that bit. Yeah. So I was born in Reading, and then um, almost immediately afterwards, my dad moved out to Kenya, where he was running uh, what was then. Um, Allsop's Brewery, and it became uh, Kenya Breweries in due course. And so uh, the first school I went to was my mum's school at home, where she created a kindergarten. And, uh, and then we came back to the UK. My dad was then running Ansel's, which was a big brewery in, in Birmingham at the time. So we grew up on the edge of Gloucestershire, near Morton in the Marsh. And, uh, and I used to go to uh, a little school at Colwell in the Malvern Hills. And then, yeah, as you say, uh, onto the uh, school that dare not mention its name. Um, after failing a music scholarship, um, I remember trying to do the singing bit with a streaming cold and a sore throat. And the bloke who showed me into the room in front of all these people, you know, he, he gave them a thumbs down. He knew it wasn't going to go well. But, um, but my parents um, somehow stumped up. And uh, so I went there. And then... Um, after there and, and, and Oxford, um, I effectively left the UK to go and work in the Far East with Cathay Pacific Airways, Hong Kong's airline owned by the Swire Group, British company. And, uh, and that's how the world of business started. I then moved around to different countries, uh, running their offices and, and stations in Indonesia, Paris, Manila, uh, yes, was this for the for this was for the for airline the, at the time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was general manager in wherever it was, you know, aged about twenty four or something. <laughs> with a crazy amount of responsibility and not a great deal of experience or knowledge, but you learn fast in those situations. Um, is and, this how you uh, so picked that's up? How it all started. Is this how you picked up your love for languages? Because you know, yeah. not many people know that you speak. Is it eight or nine languages? Yeah, yeah eight, eight languages on a good day, but as my children always say, Dad, your English isn't great shakes and needs a bit of improving and modernizing. Um, but yeah, no, the, you know, my approach to life has always been if you live somewhere, you've got to be able to communicate with people. Um, it wasn't brilliant grammatically. I was not a great linguist at school or anything like that. But I found um, with a reasonable sort of musical sense that I could, I could pick up words and I wasn't embarrassed to make mistakes. I mean, there are some languages that are easier to make mistakes in than others. Cantonese, for example, if you hit the wrong tone, uh, instead of saying, um, uh, I'd like to have uh, nine dogs, um, you, you risk asking someone to masturbate you. Um, <laughs> so, you know, hitting the right tone in, in Chinese is, is, is quite important. Yes, yeah, so I, I would imagine, especially with that one. 
you know. <laughs> so which languages can you speak? Um, so um, I think probably have trouble like, like my O levels remembering how many. <laughs> oh, French, uh, Swahili. That's from Kenya. When I went back there later as diplomat, um, Cantonese, Mandarin, Tagalog in the Philippines, Bahasa Indonesia, and Malay, which is virtually identical to Bahasa Indonesia. There are slight differences, and I think a Malaysian would probably say I'm really speaking Indonesian rather than, than Malay, but um, but it's it's as good as. Because if, if I remember rightly, aren't you uh, one of uh, the, the first MP ever in the House of Parliament to talk Indonesian? Or make I a, did a do when, yeah when there was a terrible you're quite right that when there was a terrible typhoon up in the north of one of their islands uh, I, I did uh, say a sentence uh, in Indonesian which um, got picked up by a million odd people in Indonesia the speaker doesn't really like people speaking in in foreign languages although I've noticed the Welsh MPs get away with a bit of Welsh which would be music to your ears um, but yeah, no, it's always been useful, I think. And that's probably why, you know, David Cameron made me um, a trade envoy to Indonesia in 2011. So I've now been trade envoy to three different countries and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations or ASEAN for now. This is coming into my 10th year serving three prime ministers. And I think, you know, one of the key reasons was the fact that I'd lived in most of those places, spoke their languages, uh, had some old friends. And those were very useful things to bring to the table. And uh, it's something I don't talk about very much in Gloucester, but actually that exporting to the Far East, the growth of our relationship with Asia, I think 2021 is going to be a big year for all of that. And, and it can be very useful. We, we've certainly increased business out there a lot. I mean, I know for a fact that, uh, you know, with Brexit coming on the, along the road, I don't want to go into all that sort of malarkey today. Uh, otherwise, we'll be here forever. But yes, I suppose your relationships are going to be even more important than ever. Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're doing what's called a joint trade review at the moment with Indonesia, which I hope will come to conclusion in January. Um, I, I get a sort of weekly update on the range of stuff we're doing from Coventry University selling courses to, um, whoops, I think there's a bell going. It's all right, it's not a fire alarm. It's okay. You want to pause there while the bell goes. No, no, we're okay. Carry on. Um, you know, some cyber stuff, um, aircraft, um, fantastic stuff on the health side. Every sector is really going gangbusters. And I think trade is up about 88%. It's almost doubled from where it was a few years ago. There's lots more we can do too. This is just the beginning. I think a lot of people don't realise actually how big Indonesia is. Is it 100 million people or something? It's oh, no, 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 much more than that. Yeah, no, it's, you know, it's, it's at around you know, three, 360 million oh, wow. people days of the year, roughly. And it's the, it's the fifth um, biggest country in, in the world. Wow. So, there you go. Learn something every single day. So when you left the uh, airline, where did you yeah. go next? So after I left the airline in 1986, I joined the Foreign Office because... Around that time, I'd been in the Philippines during the end of President Marcos's era, and I was quite close to the Aquino family, who then uh, effectively sort of took over. And um, Senator Aquino had been actually murdered on my aircraft stand at the airport, which I knew about, but of course was, was hushed up at the time. And his widow became the next president. And so that, I, I thought, hang on, this is really, really interesting. It would be, it would be good to be a diplomat and, and try and understand how you can try and influence things for your country. So that's what I did, Mark, from uh, effectively uh, 86 to 92, um, both uh, in Kenya, in the High Commission in Kenya, uh, and then back in Hong Kong and China as British Trade Commissioner, China, and consul for a wonderful little old Portuguese colony called Macau, just down the road from Hong Kong. Um, so they were both uh, business jobs and political jobs, and they're really interesting. And I think that that frontier between the two, between where business operates and where politics can shape things, is a really interesting one. And it's one where really I've spent most of my working life when I reflect on it, accidentally, but that's how it's worked out. So after that, what, did, what happened next? So then, um, yeah, after, after all that, I decided that um, uh, it was time to come back to the UK. That was the plan. And then suddenly, um, what was Bearings PLC said to me, oh, hang on, we'd like you to open an office as the first 
uh, investment banking group to open in China, in Shanghai. So I talked to the long-suffering Anthea about this, and she said, well, sounds a bit of an adventure. Let's give it a go. So having said we were going to leave you know, greater China and come back to the UK, off we went to Shanghai. And we did that for four fascinating years. The company I was working for went bankrupt. Um, but the new entity under the Dutch bank, IMG, carried on. And then we came back eventually in, uh, when was it, 97? Yeah. So that's three years before the election. Uh, that you were, you know, where you... Uh, no, 13 years, 13 years. 13 yeah. years, okay, so... Yeah, yeah. so I came back and I, I ran Bearing Asset Management's um, international and what they called institutional, which was largely pension funds, central banks, and so I ran their business until, well, I was doing it in theory, really, right up to the 2010 election, but I went down to four days a week after 2007 or eight in order to spend more time in Gloucester focusing on, you know, what was really needed here in our city. That, that was a crucial turning point. It was saying, okay, we've got all this experience. Let's now put it back into somewhere close to where I was brought up. And the city is more of a cause than the, the countryside because the countryside is all about really preserving it, isn't it? Making sure that it still looks gorgeous and beautiful and, mm. and works for people as well. But in the city, Cities have many more problems, endless regeneration, um, uh, citizens with uh, real numbers of problems, invariably asylum and immigration issues, uh, you name it. But we also have lots going for us, particularly on the business side. And, and all of that in a cathedral city was hugely appealing. Now, not many people know this is that obviously I've known you for a long time. I actually ran your your PR and marketing campaign to help you get elected. And I'm very proud of that, actually, Richard. And you and I do get on extremely well. We don't always agree. You have to admit, we don't always agree. Um, but um, but, um, but you I've you played a key part. I mean, the, the communicating, whether it's business, punchline, or politicians, um, getting over, honestly, what you feel and think about issues in a way that people can understand and relate to, even if they don't agree, which they're never going to always, uh, is such an important thing. And so I, I've learned from you and others, um, you know, how to do this. And the whole world has changed hugely in those yeah. 14 years, hasn't it? I mean, social media didn't exist until, you know, 10 years. No, no let alone even some of the mobile phones. I remember standing you at uh, Gloucester Railway Station in, in 2010. It was pouring down with rain. It was only you and me and Twiglet the dog. And, uh, and, and you were saying then that you're going to transform the railway station, that you're going to have a, you know, it's, it's disgusting that they didn't have disability access, car park at the front, you know, this was a gateway to the city. And here we are all those years later and you've, you've managed to achieve that. So uh, well done to well, you, sir. Well, you're very good. We're still working on it, aren't we? The underpass oh. isn't yet better. But we did get the, uh, you're quite right, we did, you know, the idea of somebody being pushed over the tracks in a wheelchair to get to, um, uh, platform four on the other side. You know, it was crazy. We had no bridge over the line, no lift to get up there. So yeah, some things have really come on. I think if I'd known when I got into politics how long some of these things were going to take, I might have thought, blimey, you know, I'm going to need a couple of lifetimes to sort of do it all. But but you're right. If you persevere and stick at things, whether business or politics, the chances are that you'll get there eventually. I mean, the, the regeneration has been, you know, it, it was started before you came on board. The keys were being built. The cost of cottage had been there. The Southwest bypass had got approval. Um, what do you think has been the biggest game changer over the last 10 years with the city, with the regeneration? What do you think, you know, is, is it the keys as people? You know, some people love it. Some people say it sucks the money out of the city. What, what do you think has been the the biggest regeneration uh, success? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the fun of it, Mark, is that there are so many individual bits. And there's also, you know, regeneration is human as much as physical. So sometimes some of the smaller community things that have reached out into the people living around them in ways that 10 years ago were sort of unimaginable has been almost as exciting as the sort of landmark physical changes. So for example, what um, largely driven by an individual because, you know, this is a human world, isn't it? And so humans make the difference. But what Vanessa has done, for example, at the Red World Centre in Matson, which is building something that's, that's not just a sort of an entity for the young. It's not just a youth club. It's not just an old people's entity. It does all of this and much, much more. And 10 years ago, it was um, 
It wasn't a fraction of any of those things. So the human regeneration is really important. And then there are some of the, the small but important things like cancer support groups. You know, again, what Joe Sutherland has done with Charlie is it didn't exist 10 years ago, anything like that. Then you've got the bigger things. Of course, the docs has been a game changer, no doubt about that. And that basically all started a bit long before I came along. So all credit to everyone who was involved with it at the start. But of course, what's happened since, it's all the bits around it that have made the difference. So I think the heritage regeneration, whether it's Atlantine, St. Mary de Crypt, Project Pilgrim at the Cathedral, you know, we've had, I think, 38 successful Heritage Lottery Fund wins since 2010. And we've got this heritage hub, which um, Heather Forbes at the what was the archives um, has really led together and brought all these people together in a way that's unique in the country. And so we get, I think, much better support on all of that. And obviously the History Festival, which I got going, has played a, a part in that. So that's another element of it. And then I think the third intangible thing is the growing self-confidence. You know, in every city, you can sort of feel the mood when you get there. You talk to the taxi drivers and everybody in the cafes. And I think, you know, for a long time, Gloucester was very good at doing ourselves down and saying, you know, well, you want somewhere good to eat? Well, you know, go down the road to Cheltenham. Uh, you want to talk about um, something green? Or go and talk to the Stroudies. Uh, you want somewhere nice to stay, you know, go and, you know, stay in some smart place in the Cotswolds. You know, on the whole, people weren't really talking up Gloucester. But now we've got masses to be proud of. The whole cultural sort of profile has changed and is going to change even more when King Square is finished and the music works is up and running and all the rest of it. So I think that confidence, um, I think our Dean once said that he came from an overconfident city, St Albans, to an underconfident one, Gloucester. But I think he would agree that Gloucester has got a lot more confident, not in a sort of brash, cocky way, but in a way of believing in ourselves. And you know, that shows through a little bit with the football club this year, back at Meadow Park, the top of their table, Gloucester rugby, new management, some exciting players, much more confident, really, than it was a decade ago. So all of this comes together. And now we've got to get through with real resilience this absolute economic and employment crisis that, that, that is hitting us. And I think we will. We will come through it. I'm convinced of that. But people like me have to keep working at the big picture things. For example, the size will see nuclear power project. That is critical to EDF Energy's operational headquarters at Barnwood. If there's one thing that you could say that you're truly proud of over this 10 years, what would that be? I'm really proud of what Gloucester as a city has achieved. And you know, I strongly believe in Ronald Reagan's thing. You know, it's amazing what you can achieve if you give other people the credit. Okay, that was one of the questions, Richard, because I'm running out of time. Uh, what, uh, what book are you reading at the moment? I got about four sort of on the go. Um, uh, the, there are a couple of books on Cromwell. As you know, I've always been fascinated by the 17th century, Colonel Massey here in Gloucester, uh, the man who changed sides but made the right call, in my view, escaped three times from the Tower of London. And Cromwell, of course, was the last man to mess around with Christmas. It didn't end well for him, which is probably <laughs> one reason why the Prime Minister is allowing us all to see our families this Christmas. Okay, and uh, what's your favorite film? Favorite film, uh, there are two, uh, Where, Where, uh, Where Eagles Dare, um, and, uh, and the other one uh, would be Dr. Chivage. All right, okay. Yeah. So the, my very last question, which I ask everybody this, what's your top three tips for business, Richard? What would they be? I think the very top one would be to stay adaptable because any business that's doing the same thing in the same way as it was 10 years ago is going to be in big trouble. Any retailer today who doesn't have an online presence and some online business is probably going to struggle. And so we all have to, as individuals, but particularly as businesses, we have to keep reinventing ourselves. So that would be my first tip. My second tip would be businesses are always love to have certainty, but life by definition is uncertain. And so I think we have to live with uncertainty better than we have in the past. And my third one would be keep believing in Gloucester, because actually this is right at the heart of a great area. We're going to have great growth. It's a good place to be based. The commercial property rates are much cheaper than they are in Cheltenham or Bristol, and you can access either very easily. So come, if you're not already here, base yourself in Gloucester and make a success of it. And I'll help. Richard, 
it's always great to talk to you. Always catch, always great to catch up with you. Thanks ever so much for joining Punchline Talks today. Thank you, Mark.